Freemasonry, mother of all secret societies, perhaps the most suspected and persecuted organization of all time. And this in spite of the fact that there are few, very few people who truly know what it's all about. Is it really, as its critics say, the hidden power behind the most important world events, or is it, as we can see today, a slightly decadent social club with childish rituals? How did this antique secret society that still boasts more than six million brethren get started? What are its real objectives? How has it influenced world events for more than 12 centuries? And more important still, how is it influencing them today? Freemasonry defines itself as an innocent fraternity whose primary objectives is to seek the welfare of humanity through the spiritual elevation of its members. But for its critics, it's just a gigantic pyramid of manipulators with the secret objective of world domination, with unwritten codes of silence and cooperation reminiscent of the Mafia. So who's right? A swift perusal of the history of Freemasonry brings to light certain disquieting characteristics. Its impenetrable secrecy, the severity of the penalties for those who break their oaths, the general public's ignorance of its true reach, influence, and real purposes. And most disturbing of all, its obvious participation in many of the key events that have changed the course of history over the last few centuries. Secret rituals, obscure symbolism, mysterious objectives, qualities made an easy target, mainly by its arch enemy, the Roman Catholic Church. And one wonders, are these real reasons to fear Freemasonry? Or is it all just a matter of groundless accusations, mere incomprehension and prejudice against enlightenment? Why do the Freemasons still maintain such secrecy if they have nothing to hide? So how did it all begin? The origins of Freemasonry go back to the 7th century, when it was founded as a guild of builders, bricklayers and stonemasons, who tried to keep secret their technical knowledge in order to protect their livelihoods. These masons were not the construction workers we might picture today, but technical and artistic masters that could undertake the most prestigious constructions at a time when building technology was limited to a set square, a plumb line, and little else. The original Masons built cathedrals and castles that endured for centuries, surviving wars, earthquakes, time. To the common people of those times, such technical accomplishments endowed the Masons with almost magical powers, powers that had to be kept secret to outsiders. Thin columns that still hold graceful, ogival arches with narrow ribs, Towers of hitherto unimaginable heights that scrape the heavens and inspire God-fearing veneration. Chambers with perfect acoustics and overhanging gargoyles to scare away evil spirits. Ratios of strength, beauty and proportion that even today surprise engineers and mathematicians. The extraordinary knowledge and skills of these men constituted the best kept secret of all time. The development of projects would take generations to complete and the accompanying know-how was passed down from father to son, from teacher to apprentice. The full preparation of an apprentice took seven years and began when he was only 12. After the first three years, there was an initiation ritual and certain codes and symbols were revealed to him. Upon completing the seventh year, he would graduate as a fellow of the craft. Only years later would he qualify as a master mason. Freemasonry soon acquired a spiritual and ideological dimension that clashed with the value system of its time. This made it the perfect organization to host ideas considered dangerous 
ideas that needed to be kept secret at all costs. This earliest manifestation of masonry is known as operative masonry, since its members were active builders. Though the society was born in the Middle Ages, masons were inspired by much older secret societies, some dating from pre-Christian times. Secret societies have existed since the dawn of civilization. They were formed in order to preserve and defend knowledge that afforded power, and to transmit and maintain ideas that offended the powers that be. Ideas whose free and open expression might have brought down a death sentence upon a person who simply dared to utter them. A good example was the Pythagoreans, who were organized like a secret society. Pythagoras was a philosopher who lived in Greece in the 6th century BC, and his discoveries had immense influence on Masonic thought. Centuries later, Pythagoras's theorem was of great importance to the operative Masons, as it allowed them, for example, to execute perfectly straight angles. Pythagoras was pursued and murdered by his enemies, but his knowledge persisted, and the set square became the emblematic symbol of Freemasonry that is still used to this day. Operative Masons clearly despised what the clergy had become just a few centuries after the death of Christ. A decadent bunch of sinners too busy looking after their worldly possessions to take time to shepherd the souls of their flock. The same feelings were felt for the oppressing nobility who owned land and life. The irony was that the Masons, ideological antagonists to the persecutory dogmatism of Rome, had in the Catholic Church and in nobility their main client. The old bas-reliefs and ornamentations of Europe's most famous cathedrals still bear witness to the sharp humour through which the Masons left evidence of their disagreement with and distrust of that omnipresent power. In the church of St. Sibald in Nuremberg, there is a tomb showing a monk and a nun in a pretty compromising position. In the cathedral of Wurzburg, replicas are found of the famous Joachim and Boaz columns that stood at the entrance of King Solomon's temple. They are fundamental symbols of masonry, together with Hiram Abiff, the mythological builder of King Solomon's temple, who was murdered because of his refusal to reveal the secret of his art, a genuine coded Masonic signature. But the belief that Freemasonry is an atheistic movement solely because of its hatred of the Catholic Church is completely misguided. The Masons simply wanted to have the liberty to worship God in the way they chose, not in the way dictated to them by Rome. To be accepted into the Brotherhood, every Mason must believe in a unique supreme being, no matter who it is. To accommodate for different beliefs and in line with their origins as builders, Masons have come to call this being Gao, or Gautu, great architect of the universe. Its symbol, the all-seeing eye, is inspired by the Egyptian eye of Oros. The Regius manuscript on display at the British Museum is an anonymous poem on the subject of moral duties and is dated around 1390. It is the oldest known Masonic document written in poetry and lists 15 commandments, among which can be read to be honest and speak true, not to steal or protect thieves or murderers, to be wise and strong and to be able to do all jobs, not to speak evil of the work of other masters, to teach the apprentices that their art is always worthy, to conceal neither falsehoods nor others in sin. The feudal age came to a close, and the Catholic Church stopped being the Masons' major client. It was then that this original guild of spiritually free bricklayers turned into a powerful and influential secret society, open to all men who wanted to accept its rules and would take an oath to keep its secrets. It was called Freemasonry, or Free and Accepted Masons. Soon it would be the key protagonist in some of the most important events in history.
let's recap. Far from being an ignorant association of superstitious bricklayers, the original operative masons were upholders of ideals of liberty that naturally brought them into conflict with those who were both their best clients and their oppressors, the Catholic Church and the European monarchies. Over time, they evolved into a powerful secret society that attracted some of the most influential figures in history and came to be known as the Freemasonry, or Free and Accepted Masons, a secret society that still operates today. The name Free and Accepted Masons was born when the original operative masonry transformed itself into a wider secret society in a period that lasted from the end of the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. Free makes reference to the fact that no slave or bondsman could join. And accepted implies that the member is accepted despite not being a builder. Though the structure and ceremonial rites of the original Masons has remained shrouded in secrecy, it is known that they were based on the Egyptian liturgy of sacerdotal initiation, the death and resurrection of Osiris, the renunciation of the indifference to a previous life, Above all, Freemasonry expects its brethren to die spiritually and be reborn as new, superior men. Even today, these original rituals are repeated in an almost identical fashion. First, the profane is led to the Chamber of Reflection, a room painted black with a table, a stool and a desk. Upon the table there is a jug of water, some bread and two cups, one filled with sulphur, the other with salt. On the walls are the symbols, the sickle, the sand claw, the rooster, and the letters V, I, T, R, I, O, L, which is an acronym for the Latin alchemical phrase, Visita interiore, terrae rectificando in vienes occultum lapidum. Visit the interior parts of the earth. By rectification, thou shalt find the hidden stone. An invitation to an inner search of the depths of the human soul, in silence and meditation. The profane answers the questions. What does man owe to God? What does man owe to himself? What does man owe to others? and he draws his last will. Blindfolded, the candidate is divested of all metallic substances, since metal represents civilization, and stands neither naked nor clothed, and similarly with his right leg uncovered as a sign of humility. His left shoe is removed, also a sign of humility. And a cable toe is placed round his neck as a symbol of what binds him to the profane world. After overcoming the tests, the blindfold is removed and he receives the light. Finally, he takes an oath to the great architect of the universe over the Book of Constitutions. A Bible with a set square and a compass on top of it are also used. Because Freemasons do not deny the existence of God, they simply reject ecclesiastical institutions. The oath is written on a paper that is later burned. When he receives the light, the candidate is initiated and the brethren point at him with swords to invest him with positive energies. In some rites, the initiate also receives a sword to symbolically defend himself, to protect the lodge, to attack his enemies, and, curiously enough, to avenge the murder of the last great master of the Knights Templar, Jacques de Molay. Freemasonry is organized into smaller groups known as lodges. We have all heard this word a thousand times over, shrouded in mystery and distrust. The origin of the first lodge is the most intriguing, since it opens the possibility that Freemasonry might be the continuation of the order of the Knights Templar, and its rituals the means to hide a thousand-year-old secret, the content and destiny of the Knights' mythical treasure. 
The first recognized Masonic Lodge in the world was the Kilwinning Lodge, Lodge Number Zero, or Mother Lodge of Scotland. And its origin dates back to the year 1140, when the Masons, who were building the neighboring abbey of Kilwinning, organized themselves into a guild. Scotland has been the epicenter of many events that seem to connect Freemasonry with the Order of the Knights Templar. To understand how, we will need to go back to the First Crusade, when two young noblemen fought side by side to free Jerusalem from the Turks. One, Hugh de Payen, would become the founder of the Knights Templar. The other, Henry Sinclair, a Scottish knight of Norman descent, would sire a dynasty that centuries later would be of vital importance for the birth of Freemasonry. The Order of the Knights Templar was founded in Jerusalem as a monastic and military order by Hugh de Payens and seven other knights after obtaining papal blessing. The Templars excavated the ruins of King Solomon's temple and legend has it that they unearthed a fabulous treasure. Whether or not there is any truth in this legend, the fact is that soon after, they became immensely rich and powerful. Some speculate that they had recovered documents that demonstrated Jesus had left descendants, thus putting the Church of Rome on the rack, who, prompted by extortion or otherwise, granted the Templars enormous benefits. Whatever the case might be, history does tell us that on returning from Jerusalem, Hugh de Payens visited Scotland, where he established the first oratorium outside the Holy Land, on territory belonging to the Sinclair clan. One legend has it that the Sinclairs, Sinclair in French, are Merovingian descendants of an alleged lineage stretching back to Jesus Christ. We have then a precursor of Scottish Freemasonry fighting side by side with the creator of the Knights Templar. This is the first fact in a sequence of coincidences that has given rise to a good deal of speculation. There are more curious facts. The Knights Templar became the financiers of monarchs all over Europe. A profitable but dangerous business that eventually sealed their fate. The persecution of the Knights Templar was unleashed in 1307, when Pope Clement VII, pressured by King Philip of France, who was enormously indebted to them, accused them of several heresies, including sodomy, adoration of the devil, baphomet, and many other mortal sins. The Knights Templar were persecuted, tortured, and their order finally eliminated. Grand Master Jacques de Molay was imprisoned and tortured for seven years, after which he was convicted to life imprisonment. Faced with the verdict, de Molay, who was already 70 years old, together with his friend Geoffrey de Charnay, claimed that all their confessions had been obtained under torture and that both they and their knights were innocent. That act of bravery sealed their fate. On the night of March the 18th, 1314, both were carried to the banks of the River Seine and burnt at the stake. De Molay died facing the Cathedral of Notre Dame praying, proclaiming his innocence, and cursing both king and pope. But the ambitious king of France could not seize the Templars' wealth. The few knights that fled the massacre apparently carried their mythical treasure with them, and the rest was passed on to the Order of the Hospital, another religious group. One of the main havens for the surviving Knights Templar was remote Scotland, whose king, Robert the Bruce, had been excommunicated by the Pope. Scotland, the land of Henry Sinclair, fellow adventurer of the First Knight Templar. The saga continues. In the mid-15th century, a descendant of Henry Sinclair, the Crusader, called William Sinclair, started construction of a chapel in Rosslyn, to the south of Edinburgh. This chapel, mentioned in the bestseller, The Da Vinci Code, was supposedly built to hide the treasure of the Knights Templar in its vault. While this can't be proved, it is undeniable that the chapel is packed with Masonic and Templar symbols. 
therefore constituting the first ever site where both Masons and Templars left their imprint. Curiously enough, the tabernacle has the same distribution and dimensions of the third reconstruction of King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, the very same one that had been excavated by the Knights Temple. Finally, a direct descendant of the builder of the Chapel of Roslyn, also called William Sinclair, would become the first Grand Master of Scottish Freemasonry at Kilwinning Lodge. This mother lodge is erected on the same grounds that had been visited by Hugh de Payens 400 years before, that is, on Sinclair land. How much truth is there in the theory that Freemasonry was born to preserve the secret of the Knights Templar? How closely were these organizations really related? Aren't there Knights Templar names and rituals in the York Rite of Freemasonry? Why Knights Templar and not something else? Let's recall the Mason initiation formula. Visit the interior parts of the earth. By retification, thou shalt find the hidden stone. The Knights Templar dug for years seeking something hidden. Is it all just a peculiar coincidence? It is indeed possible that both Freemasonry and the Knights Templar were intimately related from the time of their origins. But it is also plausible that they became related somewhat later, due to a simple ideological affinity, since both societies shared an anti-clerical and anti-monarchical ideology, and they both knew very well what it was like to be persecuted. Perhaps the mysterious bond between Masons and Knights Templar will never be proven, since those who know Masonic secrets are forbidden to reveal them for fear of painful torture followed by death. Such is the punishment for those brethren who reveal the secrets of the Lodge. The Oath of the Tenth Degree of the Scottish Rite is just one of the many examples of the brutality with which Freemasonry condemns its betrayers. It concludes, and in failure of this, my obligation, I consent to have my body opened perpendicularly and to be exposed for eight hours in the open air, that the venomous flies may eat my entrails, my head to be cut off and put on the highest pinnacle of the world, and I will always be ready to inflict the same punishment on those who shall disclose this degree and break this obligation. An oath that one would think twice about before breaking. In the 17th century, Freemasonry acquired such importance that it began to make powerful enemies. Its inner circles became tighter and tighter. Its power to influence society grew in proportion to its expansion. Very soon they began to pull the strings of history. Strings that perhaps they still pull today. Anti-Catholic, libertarian, conspirational, all kinds of accusations have been laid at the door of Freemasonry. Their particular method of organization and their lexicon packed with mystifying words such as right, orient, apprentice and master have surely contributed to their reputation. Freemasonry is an international organization that is subdivided into lodges or independent chapters without a global governing authority. In the hierarchy of Freemasonry, there are three degrees which are taken in sequence. Apprentice, Fellow of the Craft, and Master Mason. A lodge that confers all three degrees is called a Blue Lodge, or Great Lodge, which constitutes the foundation of Freemasonry. Then there are the so-called appendages, such as the York Rite and the Scottish Rite, to reach this hallowed level, one must have first achieved the third degree, that of Master Freemason. The York and Scottish Rites offer 10 and 33 degrees respectively, with their corresponding rituals and symbols. Another offshoot of Freemasonry is the Rosicrucian Order, that does share a common origin, but also incorporates mystical elements, alchemy, 
and other philosophical principles that set it apart from what we understand by Freemasonry today. An understanding of the symbols of Freemasonry will surely help us shed some light on its true purpose and ambitions. If we look carefully enough, we will see their imprints in the most unlikely places, reminders that they have been there too, and still are. Freemason symbols convey ideas of spiritual growth, and many of them are inspired on those of the original Mason builders. The plumb line suggests rectitude, the spirit level, equality, the set square uprightness, virtue, and forthrightness. It is identified with the worshipful master. The compass symbolizes the Masonic ideals of friendship, morality, and fraternal love. When drawing a circle, the central point is the Freemason, and the circle is his world. The Freemason should live according to the principles of friendship, morality, and fraternal love. The trowel symbolizes the mortar that cements the Mason brethren. The 24-inch ruler stands for the 24 hours of the day. The hammer reminds the Masons they should work on shaping and improving their character. The five-pointed star symbolizes the supreme being, and also the five points of camaraderie, a secret that cannot be revealed. The white ram blanket represents purity. The slipper reminds Masons of their preparations for the degree. To enter the temple, they must remove their shoes and put on slippers. The point inside the circle with the two lines running parallel along it and the book above it symbolize the earth, the point, the heavens, the circle, and the two solstices, the parallel lines, which are the two main festive days of the year for Freemasons. The letter G is God, or Gautu, great architect of the universe, and is an American edition. It was first used in the USA, together with the set square and the compass, in around 1850. A very particular way of shaking hands allows Freemasons to recognize each other in secret. From what we have learned so far, the accusations and persecutions that Freemasonry has suffered seem to be due more to the prejudice and dogmatic and dictatorial institutions than to its own wrongdoing. So is Freemasonry just an innocent brotherhood that merely seeks to advance the cause of human progress? Its critics have a very different opinion. Freemasonry has been accused of practically everything ranging from constituting an atheist, anti-Catholic, and treacherous mafia, to fostering a global conspiracy to control the world through its secret power networks. The Catholic Church did not hesitate to excommunicate Freemasons. Most European monarchies decided to directly ban the order. Between 1738 and 1890, the Vatican passed 17 papal bulls condemning Freemasonry and urging its proscription. This did not deter many Christian monarchs from joining their ranks, while others fought them openly. King James III of Scotland was the first monarch suspected of being a Freemason. The first European sovereign to officially support Freemasonry was the Holy Roman Emperor Francis I, founder of the Royal House of Austria, and curiously enough, a Catholic. The monarchs of Holland, Sweden, Geneva, Zurich, Bern, Bavaria, Austria, Russia, and Prussia outright banned it. One of the main accusations levied against Freemasonry is that it works through Machiavellian means, even when its ends might be altruistic, as if the end justifies the means. But isn't this the trite self-justification used by every power group? In what way is Freemasonry different from any other powerful organization? Some authors believe that prior to the French Revolution, the Duke of Orleans, himself Grand Orient of France, bought all the wheat that he could get his hands on and either concealed it or sold it beyond the French borders in order to provoke the famine that led to the French Revolution. However, the Jacobins, who at the time were also being accused of being Masons and Illuminati, closed all the lodges two years after their rise to power. Perhaps they did so because they were worried about the great power the Brotherhood seemed to have. 
and at the time French Freemasonry boasted around 630 lodges with some 75,000 followers. Nor did it help their public image when by the end of the 18th century the detested order of the Illuminati of Bavaria had infiltrated most of their lodges. Since then, Freemasonry has been suspected of conspiring to seize world power. The Order of the Illuminati was created by a Bavarian citizen, Adam Weishaupt, in 1776. Highly opinionated and a true megalomaniac, Weishaupt aspired to dissolve all forms of government, ban religions, abolish private property, and create a new world order under his unified command. He affected infiltration tactics in Freemasonry and so managed to spread his organization across almost all of Europe and some even believe North America too. To stop the infection, many monarchs decided to prescribe Freemasonry altogether. The Order of the Illuminati was officially banned in 1790. But its participation in subsequent events is highly likely and many believe it is still operative today. In spite of the Illuminati episode, Freemasonry gained prestige and continued to expand its membership. Important historical figures would soon join its ranks. Learned men, nobles, bourgeoisie, the military. Freemasonry has gained prestige and attracted free thinkers who lurked in the shadows. Their meetings were organized by means of hidden signs. The identity of the masters was only known to those who had come up through the ranks. The result of their actions left practically no traces in history. But their presence was definitely real. Its influence was strongly felt in the Americas, infiltrating the highest circles of civilian and military power. Freemasons played crucial roles in the liberation of both the British and Spanish American colonies. The USA is perhaps Freemasonry's most outstanding legacy. Its national symbols are loaded with Masonic messages. A partial list of the most famous Freemasons in history will help us perceive the true importance of this secret society and how it has inf influenced history. The banker, Nathan Mayer Rothschild, the musician Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and the German poet Goethe were all Freemasons. Britain was particularly prolific in producing famous Freemasons. English kings George V, William IV, Edward VII and VIII and George VI. Also English politicians George Canning, Cecil Rhodes and Winston Churchill. The inventor of penicillin, Sir Alexander Fleming. Writers, Alexander Pope, Edward Gibbon, Sir Walter Scott, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Rudyard Kipling, plus dozens of the generals, admirals, and air marshals. Even actor Peter Sellers was a Freemason. The United States does not lag behind. Most of their founding fathers, judges, congressmen, senators, and generals were Freemasons. Also American presidents Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Lyndon B. Johnson, and Gerald Ford. The director of the American nuclear program, Vannevar Bush. The director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. Henry Ford, and also Steve Wozniak, co-founder of Apple Computers, all were Freemasons. In South America, figures like Simon Bolivar, San Martin and Benito Juarez were also Freemasons. And the list just goes on and on. The importance and popularity that Freemasonry acquired earned it more bloodthirsty enemies than the Catholic Church. Paradoxically, the bloodiest and most effective persecution launched against Freemasonry came from another excommunicated group, the Bolsheviks. Freemasonry actually survived the first stages of the Russian Revolution and was tolerated until 1922 when the Fourth International decreed that it was an ideology incompatible with communism. A 
At that point, some lodges were disbanded and others went underground. In 1926, a strange request from Mason Boris Astromov to Joseph Stalin to allow masonry to operate under official sanction resulted in the arrest, torture and imprisonment of known masons. Freemasonry disappeared totally during the remaining years of Soviet rule. Astronov himself was detained, interrogated, and died soon after his release. Freemasonry disappeared, or survived in the shadows. The first Russian lodge to operate freely again was the Harmony Lodge. And that did not happen until as recently as 1992. In the 20th century, Freemasonry would suffer not only the persecution from the Bolsheviks, but also from the Nazis. It was in this century that the term Jewish Masonic was coined, and the most daring conspiracy theories saw the light. How much truth there is in all this? How much is straightforward anti-Semitism? Why has Freemasonry attracted throughout the ages the wrath of established powers like a lightning rod? The 20th century was not kind to Freemasonry. During the communist era, it was banned in all of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Its lodges dissolved, its libraries destroyed, its members pursued and imprisoned. It fared no better in Nazi Germany. In Mein Kampf, Hitler proclaimed that Freemasonry had been infiltrated by the Jews and that it was now their instrument. He wrote that, the pacifist feelings and the paralysis of the nationalist instinct were the result of Masonic manipulations. He gave early impetus to what would soon become a long list of anti-Semitic accusations against Freemasonry. Hitler dissolved all the lodges in Germany and accused Freemasonry of conspiring with the Jews to establish a world republic similar to what the Illuminati had postulated more than a hundred years before. In 1935, Goebbels accused 300 members of the Jewish race and Masonic conspirators of having allowed the USSR to enter the League of Nations. Two years later, he opened an anti-Masonic exhibition that displayed incriminatory objects. In the Nazi concentration camps, Freemasons had to wear a distinctive red inverted triangle. It is estimated that in Nazi Germany and its occupied territories, between 80 and 200,000 Freemasons were murdered. In 1924, in Italy, Mussolini decreed that fascists had to choose between being fascists or Freemasons. And the following year, he ordered the dissolution of Freemasonry. The supposed relationship between Judaism and Freemasonry that both Nazis and fascists decried was never proven, but served to stoke racial hatred. The fact remains that Freemasonry was born in the very heart of Christian societies, and only after a number of centuries had passed did it accept Jews as well as Muslims or anyone who believed in a superior being. A detail that went unnoticed or was simply ignored by both Hitler and Mussolini. Franco Spain was also an important setting for anti-Masonic persecutions. During the dictatorship of Francisco Franco, Freemasons were tortured and executed without trial all over the country. Freemasonry only became legal again after the death of the dictator in 1975. In more recent times, Saddam Hussein introduced the death penalty in Iraq for those who promote or support Zionist principles, including Freemasonry. What does this tell us about Freemasonry? Judging on the quality of its enemies, there's not much to add. But what about Freemasonry today? At present, it is estimated there are still between four and six million active Masons distributed among some hundred thousand lodges worldwide. Most lodges are now a sort of social club where charity, ancestral rights, secrets, 
curious clothes, and even bingo competitions and theme parties coexist. Masons no longer hide their membership to the Brotherhood, and even boast bumper stickers that clearly identify them. Most even have their own web pages. They also donate huge amounts of money to charity. The main problem today is that the young have little or no interest in joining their ranks. Perhaps Freemasonry is being defeated by time. Its ancient liturgy, its moral principles, its opposition to religious authorities who have become less and less important as time goes by, sits uneasily in a culture attuned to postmodernism and the internet, virtual games, individualistic cults, or the insatiable consumer society, or the advancement of a man and spirituality, have little place. Perhaps their waning also has to do with their reluctance to accept women outside ancillary lodges for ladies. A stubborn archaism that still persists. Perhaps the last and greatest Masonic accomplishment of the 20th century has been the routing of Hitler and Nazism. Roosevelt, Truman, Churchill, King George VI, General Bradley, MacArthur and Marshall, all of them were Masons. Many years have passed since then. However, there are still some events that can be ascribed to Freemasonry, flickers of life that tell us that the giant may only be sleeping. In 1997, British Labour MP Chris Mullin launched a bitter attack on Freemasonry. Mullin was convinced that police Freemasons bestowed special privileges on criminal Freemasons. There was a lot of hysteria in the British press, but in the end nothing was ever proven. In the National Assembly of Wales, it has been obligatory since 1999 for parliamentary Freemasons to reveal their status. Judges and the police have been asked to do so voluntarily. So if Freemasonry today is just a tawdry social club, why did Saddam Hussein persecute them? While in the United Kingdom they forced Freemason policemen and judges to reveal themselves as Masons. Two countries ideologically at loggerheads who've recently waged war once shared a common enemy. Is it simply because Freemasons are an easy target for politicians? Freemasonry has always been characterized by its shape-shifting abilities, for having a low profile, and for going underground at the right time. This strategy has reaped them splendid rewards for centuries. New names, new ways, new members. It wouldn't be at all impossible that they could be applying those same tactics today. Can a society that has influenced the most important events and attracted key historical figures simply fade out of existence? Is it possible that this new silence, this apparent senility, is simply concealing a change of plans and strategies? Our daily life is often affected by decisions that are unknown to us, and Freemasons might still be behind them, without us even suspecting it. Not to mention the powerful manipulation exercised by the media, much of which is in the hands of Masonic brethren. Is it not right to wonder through which channels Freemasonry's subtle messages reach us?